Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so one of the important topics when we talk about uh, coenzymes and so forth is heme. And we looked in a series of other videos at the biosynthesis of heme. We looked at how heme functions. We looked at different enzymes like P450s, all sorts of stuff. But what happens when heme needs to be destroyed? We have this giant molecule, and it seems kind of unreasonable that this big macro cycle, we're going to break it down for energy like acetyl-CoA, you know, we're actually not going to do that. It's actually a, it's actually more or less a really inefficient uh, catabolism because we're really only going to break it apart at a couple points, okay, and then we're just going to excrete this massive waste product, okay, or a series of waste products, I'll say, okay. So we're going to start with heme. And then we're going to very briefly look at this catabolic pathway and then kind of go into some of the implications of it, because it's actually a rather interesting thing. All right. Now, first of all, where do we find heme? Heme is in enzymes. Okay, there's heme in cytochrome P450s. There's heme in cytochrome C, which is part of the electron transport chain. Um, heme is, an, is a member of nitric oxide synthase. So there's a lot of really important enzymes. I can go on and on and on about this, but there's a lot of enzymes that use heme. There's other proteins that do as well, hemoglobin and myoglobin. If we're talking about hemoglobin, we're obviously talking about the heme that carries oxygen in the blood, attached indirectly to red blood cells. Okay, so we're going to talk about this with respect to what happens if a red blood cell dies or it needs to be degraded. Their lifespan is not forever. It's only about 120 days. Well, you're going to have to get rid of this heme. And it turns out we actually turn over a lot of heme all the time. Let's talk about how we do that. We have heme here at the top. This is specifically heme B. Heme is going to react with an enzyme called heme oxygenase. Now, heme oxygenase is present all over the body. There's a lot of places in the body where heme is degraded. The main place it's going to be degraded is the liver and spleen. It's upregulated in response to all sorts of kinds of stress. Um, if you are in some kind of metabolic stress, this enzyme is going to get upregulated. So you break the heme down and potentially uh, scavenge the iron for other uses, okay? But heme oxygenase is going to open the ring. It's going to open it specifically at this position labeled alpha, okay? And when it opens up the ring, it forms this molecule called biliverdin. Now, heme oxygenase is interesting for a number of reasons. Number of one, it itself is a P450. Heme oxygenase, the enzyme that degrades heme, is itself a P450, which means it uses heme. In other words, it's using heme to break open heme. Kind of an interesting concept. Um, on top of that, it also removes the iron from the heme. Notice in Billy Verdon down here, you don't see the iron. That's because the iron is removed by heme oxygenase. And on top of that, one of my favorite things to mention about heme oxygenase, it's the only reaction in human biochemistry that produces carbon monoxide. We always think of carbon monoxide as this dangerous thing you inhale from car exhaust or cigarettes or something, right? But it turns out we manufacture carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, I should say, a lot of it all the time. Every reaction of heme oxygenase produces a carbon monoxide. And it turns out that the carbon monoxide is going to bind to that iron and it's going to bind to other hemes. And it turns out also that carbon monoxide, we may not think about it this way, um, but in small amounts produced by this enzyme, it's actually, it actually serves as a, a chemical messenger. Kind of an interesting thing. Now, you can overdo it by sitting in your car in the garage with the garage door down. That's how people commit suicide. But, dark topic, but in any ways, we make carbon monoxide. So I kind of like that enzyme. In any case, biliverdin is going to be reduced to bilirubin by biliverdin reductase, just a simple NADPH-dependent reduction. And it's just going to do, reduce one of the double bonds, particularly this one right here. Okay? Notice that it's been reduced to an alkane there with a slight rearrangement of double bonds. Bilirubin is then going to react with an enzyme called uh, bilirubin diglucuronyl transferase. Glucuronyl transferases are designated by their gene name, UGT, and then usually a, a number letter number designation. The particular one that glucuronidates bilirubin is UGT1A1. Okay? Even though they do occur in the liver, those two reactions occur in a lot of places, okay? This glucuronosyl transferase, however, is predominantly in the liver. 
So in any case, the bilirubin is going to have to go to the liver. Then we're going to diglucuronidate it. You see this glue right here attached to the O of the carboxyl. That's the glucuronacil group. And we do it twice and generate this molecule called bilirubin diglucuronide. Okay. Bilirubin diglucuronide is, for our purposes, an end product. Okay, that's as far as we're going to do with our own eukaryotic cells. In fact, the bilirubin diglucuronide is going to be dumped into the intestines um, through the bile duct. Okay, it's going to be dumped into the intestines. And what happens from it there depends on what the bacteria, the microflora in your gut do. Okay, so it turns out from bilirubin diglucuronide, anything else that we produce, including urobilinogen, stercobilinogen, urobilin, stercobilin, all that stuff, it turns out that that's all dictated on the bacteria in your intestine, okay? So let's kind of go over the organ level a concept of what's happening. So heme, as we know, is mostly degraded in the spleen and liver. It's specifically going to be done by macrophages, but it's done in the liver nonetheless, okay? So we're just going to talk about it being done in the liver, even though it's done other places. We're going to specifically say the liver. So we know heme reacts with heme oxygenase to give us biliverdin, right? The biliverdin then reacts with biliverdin reductase to give us bilirubin. And it turns out that the bilirubin, wherever the bilirubin is produced, it has to be transported through the blood to the liver. You see the bilirubin there in the liver. And the liver is going to be the site where it's diglucuronidated. Remember, we looked at that enzyme, UGT1A1, a glucuronosyl transferase. In the liver, it's going to be diglucuronidated to give us bilirubin diglucuronide. From there, that bilirubin diglucuronide is excreted into the small intestine in bile. Okay? Now, the bilirubin, once it's in there, the bacteria, the microflora in your gut, do a lot of transformations to it. Okay? They can form things like urobilinogen, stercobilin, and there are other things, stercobilinogen, urobilin. Particularly the urobilin, it's known that the urobilinogen gets converted to stercobilin and stercobilinogen. It's also known that the urobilinogen can go to the kidney and be formed as urobilin. So it turns out that the, the prefix of those bilins or bilinogens plays a role in what they look like. Urobilin or urobilinogen, of which urobilin is the main one, has a yellow color. In fact, the name uro, or the prefix, actually comes from the fact that it's in urine. It's actually urobilinogen, or urobilin, is actually what makes the urine have a yellow color to it. Urobilin. Stercobilin and stercobilinogen, which is sort of an intermediate between urobilinogen and stercobilin, but mainly stercobilin, has a brown color. In fact, the stercobilin is actually what makes your poop, your fecal matter, brown. So urobilin and stercobilin, the final end products from the bacteria's perspective, the urobilin makes your pee yellow and the stercobilin makes your poop brown. And from there, obviously, that means the urobilin is excreted in the urine and the stercobilin is excreted in the feces. So it's kind of an interesting catabolic pathway. The first half of it we do, it's eukaryotic, with some interesting things that I pointed out earlier, but also the last half of it is bacterial metabolism in the intestines. They take the bilirubin diglucuronide, convert it to urobilinogen, then urobilinogen gets converted to urobilin, which goes to the kidneys, or the urobilinogen first goes to stercobilinogen and then stercobilin, and that makes the poop brown. That's excreted in the, from the intestines in the feces. So I just find this very interesting. And what's more is there's actually a method that you don't even need to be a scientist to do, but it's kind of interesting, if you've ever gotten a contusion, what's a contusion? A contusion is a fancy term for a bruise. So something smacks you really hard, usually in the leg or something, and you get a bruise, a contusion. Well, if you look at the bruise, the initial color of it is usually like either reddish or dark red, sometime in the purple area. Those colors, these three right here, purple, this kind of indigo, and red, that's because when you get the bruise, you have a lot of that heme there. Remember, heme in general is going to emit in this range of colors. Now, heme, as we know, is going to get degraded to biliverdin by heme oxygenase. Whenever you have the conversion to biliverdin, the bruise starts to turn a greenish color. You've probably seen it at some point in your life. After you've had a bruise for a while, it starts to look green. 
that's actually biliverdin. Remember, heme oxygenase and biliverdin reductase are expressed all over the body. So if you got a hit on your leg, something crashed into your leg, and you see that contusion, you can actually follow the progression of the reaction with time by just looking at the color of the bruise. So when heme oxygenase breaks open that heme ring to get biliverdin, it turns green. And so if you have enough of that happening, then your bruise starts to look green. And one way I remember that is biliverdin, verde, is Latin for green. Um, if you speak Spanish or know a little bit of Spanish, verde is green. I know I don't pronounce it very well, but that's where the name Billy Verdon comes from. All right? And it will eventually start to turn more yellowish, and finally, it'll get to this color, and that means there's more Billy Rubin present. The reason that it changes color from Billy Verdon to Billy Rubin is remember the reaction of Billy Verdon reductase. It's breaking the conjugation right here. It breaks the conjugation, and so that changes the emission properties of the molecule such that it's not green anymore. It's more in the yellowish kind of tan color, okay? So this is a, col a colorometric way of following the progress of a bruise, and you can actually physically observe with the, your naked eye these reactions, and potentially whenever the bruise is completely gone, when you don't see it, that means that the bilirubin has been transported to the liver. It's no longer there, the bilirubin is now glucuronidated, and it's probably already excreted by the time you notice it. All right, so hopefully this video gave you some enlightenment on this. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.